Okay, so for today, quick show of hands. Who's familiar with spectral sequences? Who's heard the word spectral sequence before? I should see every hand because I, at the very least, said it, and I know it's been said before. So, okay. So, okay. Just curious. Um, I was asked to review some of what I talked about last time. It seems like parts of the discussion, especially, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess, of the Frodenthal suspension theorem's proof were a little mysterious. So I want to just give a, a sort of brief overview of that, and then I'll pick up with where I'd, I'd finished last time. So the heart of the argument was this step again. I want to understand homotopy classes of maps from an induced k-sphere into y. And I want to compare this to homotopy classes of maps from the same induced sphere into loops v, sigma v, y. And then we had our adjunctions that said maps out of something induced not sure why I wrote it in the middle. So, this is just H equivariant maps from the k-sphere into y, which of course we know this is the same as maps from the k-sphere into the h fixed points of y. And then this one was H equivariant maps from the k-sphere into loops, suspension, y, which I could rewrite via the adjunction properties of the loops as the k plus v sphere mapping into the v-fold suspension of y. And then I had a restriction map that took me to the k plus v h fixed points into the vh suspension of the h fixed points of y. So the whole argument was actually just analyzing this diagram. In fact, just analyzing this diagram was, it took sort of about 50 minutes probably yesterday. And then everything that's labeled as an isomorphism, well, these are things we'd already talked about. And then I spent time on this map. Well, this was just the ordinary Frodenthal suspension theorem because I don't have any adornment on my homotopy classes of maps. This is just ordinary homotopy classes of maps between two spaces. And this is exactly the setup that Brooks spent a lot of time talking about. So then I determined some conditions. And this was the one that, if you look in your notes yesterday, the first condition, namely that the H fixed points of V is non-trivial, that ensured that this map was an isomorphism through some range. So I'm looking at something that maps into at least one suspension. The part that was undoubtedly confusing was this one. I want to know when is this map an isomorphism. And the way I should think about this one is here I have maps from some equivariant space into some other equivariant space, and I'm looking at equivariant maps. So these are the fixed points on the mapping space. What I'd love to do is say that's the same as just moving the fixed points in to each of the arguments. And so the whole thing is when can I do that? And we used obstruction theory to analyze the difference between these maps and these maps, namely to what extent, when is this map surjective? And it's surjective when any map that I have from here into here extends to a map from here into here. And obstruction theory told me exactly when that happens, and that was my second condition. I literally just asked, when does obstruction theory guarantee that any map extends? It guarantees that any map extends when the extension groups are zero. And I can insist that the extension groups are zero if the coefficients with respect to which I'm taking homology are the zero group. 
So that was my second assumption. The second assumption was actually that all of the obstruction groups for extending from this sphere to that sphere vanish. And then I don't have to worry anymore because I wanted to know that that top map was an isomorphism and I've rewritten it as a chain of isomorphisms going around the big loop under the assumptions that I had. So that was the whole argument. And then I very briefly mentioned that this map I should think of as a kind of fixed points, but it's not the fixed points in the mapping space. It's this kind of fixed points that just ignores any induced cells. So the difference between this sphere and that sphere is the presence of cells with stabilizers that are proper subgroups of H. So if I have some mechanism to just throw away those cells in things like mapping spaces, then I guarantee that this is an isomorphism. All right, so then that was my, uh, in that case, six-minute summary of the Frodenthal suspension theorem. The next thing I talked about was uh, the wedge versus the product. And the way I stated it was, um, it was, of course, a lie, but that I stated it that way to give you intuition and to sort of try and use symbols that look familiar. The statement that I wrote down is true once I pass to spectra. In fact, I would define spectra exactly the way that Brooke defines spectra. And then I can see that the issue um, actually showed up in Aaron's question yesterday, namely, suspension doesn't commute with Cartesian product. So, phrased another way, if I take the Cartesian product of suspension spectra, it's not the same thing as the suspension spectrum of the Cartesian product. You actually knew that. If you think back to Hatcher, and you look when Hatcher starts talking about the suspension, I have the Cartesian product of two spaces, and I know what the, by the Kunith theorem, what the cohomology of that looks like. It looks like the tensor product of the cohomologies of the two things. I guess I'm working over a field. So it looks like the tensor product of the cohomologies of the two spaces that show up. But then I have each of the cohomologies of the spaces sitting inside, and in fact, the inclusion of the wedge into the Cartesian product induces, well, if I was doing homology, which means I lose the ring structure, then it induces exactly the inclusion of those two tensor factors as the, inside the tensor product. Stably, so after I suspend once, the Cartesian product splits. It splits as the wedge of the two suspensions together with the suspension of the smash product of the two things. So I know that when I look at the, as I take the suspensions of the Cartesian product, I know that I'm going to see that extra factor always. It's, it's not going to go away. So the better statement, the one that's actually honest, and the one that I proved yesterday, is that the coproduct wedge wedge is the product in the Spanier Whitehead category. In other words, homotopy classes of maps, stable homotopy classes of maps into the wedge of two spaces is the same as a pair of maps, one into each of the spaces. And if you trace through the argument I gave, this is the one that matters, that when I analyze what's happening over here, I would choose a representative, and, now, and then I choose my sphere to mapping into things to be big enough, and I see at the end of the day I'm comparing exactly the two spaces, namely x, some big suspension of x wedge y, so like the nth suspension of x wedge the nth suspension of y, with the nth suspension of x cross the nth suspension of y, and then my connectivity argument works, uh, mutatis mutandis. So, now I want to do the equivariant version. 
And that's where, that's where I left off yesterday and where I want to pick up today. So let me start with an observation. We saw last time, I should probably get these things names. So I had my category of G spaces. And then we saw that I have my forgetful functor, which took me to H spaces. And this had a left adjoint. And the left adjoint was that G cross over H functor. On the other hand, the forgetful functor also has a right adjoint. And this one is functions, H equivariant functions from G into something. So how does this one work? If you give me a G space, or sorry, an H space X, then I can consider the H equivariant maps from G into X. And how is G an H set? Well, it's an H, well, it's lots of ways it's an H set. One of the ways is H acts on G, well, H acts on G. I guess that's the easiest way to say it, because H is a subgroup of G. And so I can consider the H equivariant maps from G into any H space. On the other hand, I can choose one of the two sides that H is acting on. And then the, on the other side, I still have the leftover G action from G acting on itself on the other side. So this has both an H action and a G action, and those two actions commute. So when I take the equivariant functions, so I guess the language I've been using is this is that H maps from G into something. When I take the H equivariant functions, that eats up the H action, but I still have the leftover G action that I can use. This one looks like a disjoint union of G mod H copies of my space. This one looks like the Cartesian product of G mod H copies of my space. And the group acts by rotating the coordinates around, whereas the group acted here by rotating the layers around. And you can check, it's not hard to check, that in fact this is the right adjoint to the forgetful functor. So in particular, I have a natural map. G cross over HX maps to the functions from G into X. And all of this, all of what we do in equivariant stable homotopy, in some ways is, is playing with to what extent this is an equivalence or not. You should think about this as being very much in the same spirit as this sort of statement, but in the way I wrote it yesterday. Namely, I have a wedge of two spaces mapping into the product of two spaces, and I want to say that's a stable equivalence. Here, this looks like, well, if I'm in the pointed context, it's a wedge of G mod H spaces mapping into the product of G mod H spaces. And in the stable context, I'm not supposed to distinguish between wedges and products. This is one of the things that makes stability great, that makes it much more like something like the category of modules. Direct sums are direct products in the finite case. It's what this is showing me. So that's what I want. I want to know that my finite direct sums, but now the group acts by moving the summands around, are the same as finite direct products, where again the group acts by moving the factors around. So let me show you why that's not um, necessarily going to work the same way. So let me just do an example. And the only examples I ever seem to do are with C2, and in fact later today I'm going to spend more time with it. So let's think about how we argued this one. 
We did it via connectivity. And I want to look at including a wedge of things. But now the group acts by swapping the two factors. So I'll just draw it like this to remind you that that's what the group is doing. I'm including this into the product of those two things. And again, the group is acting by swapping the two factors. And then when I crush this out, then I get just what I'll write as the smash product of the two things. And again, I'll indicate the group action. So now I want to actually be really concrete. And I'm going to say x is s1. Because eventually, this is the one that I'm going to need, because I want to start suspending. So I'll start with the simplest case. And this one, I can draw. So the x cross x, well, that's the torus. And I'll draw it as the usual identification of the square. And then I have the inside filled in. So this is the whole thing. Now, what's the group action here? Well, the group action, I wonder if you'll be able to see this. The group action is, I can choose it to be the one that just flips over that diagonal. So that's a description of S1 cross S1 with the flip action. And now you see it as sort of a, an equivariant space. And then what's the S1 wedge S1? That's the boundary sitting inside there. And again, it's flipped. So I'm just doing the same thing. I'm not going to draw the, the red part. And so I want to understand what x smash x is then. Well, this is the torus, this this square, but then I've crushed out the entire boundary circle. What is that? It's S2. And what's the action? You'll have to speak a little louder, because the acoustics are magically such that you can hear any word I say, but I can hear few of yours. Do we think the action is trivial? No. In fact, I'm probably not going to be talking about it if it's trivial. <laughs> Do I think it's one that you'd actually be able to identify? Yes. Is it one that I could draw a picture for? Oh, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm swapping the hemispheres. So help me draw this picture. How would I see that? Oh, I know. This is, uh, this is horrible. I'm asking you to, to visualize these things. Well, the way I would think about visualizing this is actually just rotating this red line so that it becomes the real axis. Now I will draw it. And I'm thinking of this as being in the complex plane. And I might as well have rounded this out. And now I'm looking at this figure, where the whole, in, the whole white circle is actually going to be crushed to a point. And then I have just the interior of my unit disk in the complex numbers and the complex conjugation action. So the boundary is being crushed to a point. Exactly. So this is then the same when I crush the boundary to a point as the unit sphere in the complex numbers viewed as a C2 space with complex conjugation. So when I write it this way, it's actually hiding something. So I want to describe that in a slightly different way. The complex numbers with complex conjugation is actually the representation ring itself. I'm sorry, the group ring itself. I'm working over the real numbers. So the representation theory is actually fairly simple. I have exactly two representations, irreducible representations, for the group of order two. I have the trivial one, and I have the real sign representation. 
And then this just splits as copies of each of those, and that's what I'll call them. And most of the time, I'll also probably slip up and call this row for regular representation. What did I see here then? I took two copies of S1, and when I smashed them together, but flipping the two factors, I didn't build S2 with a trivial action. I built a new representation sphere. Just like when I smash spheres together, I get new spheres. When I smash representation spheres together, even if I allow the group to act by moving the smash factors around, I again get representation spheres. So more generally, if I take the n sphere and smash it with itself and give it the flipping action, then this is homeomorphic to n times the regular representation sphere. And if I had just a v-sphere, so now I'm letting the group act non-trivially, and I smash it with itself, then this one's homeomorphic to the v-tensor, the regular representation sphere. And you'd argue them exactly the same way. You sort of see exactly what's going to happen. In fact, for the n-sphere, smash the n-sphere, the easiest thing is actually to break this up into a bunch of copies of the one sphere smash itself, n of them. And then we just worked out what the one sphere smash itself was, and then I had n of those that I was smashing together, but not doing anything weird to the action. n times is the direct sum? n times is the direct sum, yes. So that's probably a better way to put it. Thank you. Of the v-sphere. Mm-hmm. So now V here is just an arbitrary representation, as you want to. So if you're familiar with the representation theory language, then what I've really done is I've taken one of my representations and I've sent it to the induced representation from the trivial group up to the group C2. So that always works. If I, again, have some, some finite group, and I smash a representation sphere with itself, and I allow the group to act by permuting the coordinates, and the coordinates are, say, parameterized by g mod h, then it always looks like the induced representation sphere from h to g. OK, so now I want to copy this, but I first want to make an observation, and that is that the fixed points, so s, v, tensor rho, the h fixed points of this, well, I guess it's C2, so there's sort of two options, but I'll just look at the C2 fixed points of this, is s to the dimension of v. Whereas if I looked at the generically, the fixed points so I'm going to make a statement but I'll just put it in quotes to indicate this sort of what's happening in the aggregate is this looks like s dimension v over 2 V is a vector space. I mean the real dimension of that vector space. Exactly. So V is a complex represent is a real representation. So this is just the real dimension of that representation. So of course, what do I really mean by this? That that C2 fixed points, it counts the number of trivial representations and it throws away the number of sign representations. So if I had a generic representation, I'd expect that I'm going to have about as many trivial and sign representations. Each of them contributes one to the dimension of the representation, but I'm only counting the trivial ones for the dimension of the fixed points. So in the aggregate, it's about a half. In particular, 
the dimensions of these scale in the same way that the dimensions scaled for the ordinary smash product. That if I smash two things together, I get something that's about twice as connected as what I started with. Here I'm again seeing it's about twice as connected. But it's only about twice as connected when I allow myself to use representation spheres. If I didn't use representation spheres, so this equals fails miserably if V is actually trivial. If V is trivial, then there's no difference between the V sphere and its C2 fixed points because the group acts trivially on it and then the dimension of that is the same as the dimension of the underlying thing is the same as this fixed point dimension. Um, I'm dividing it by two uh, because I have two irreducible representations which are both one dimensional and I'm only counting one of the two of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to stick still with C2, but I'm going to copy the argument about the difference between the, the wedge and the smash product. So if I look at SV smash X wedge X, well, this maps into, this is actually homeomorphic to SV smash X wedge SV smash X because again wedge distributes our smash distributes over wedge and I swap the two factors still this maps into SV smash X cross SV smash X and then it maps to SV smash SV flip smashed with x smash x, flipped. And I want to know, what's the connectivity of this map? So this is the fixed points of V connected, because I don't really know anything about the connectivity of this. So I want the coarsest possible estimates I can get, and that means I actually ignore the space entirely. So this one is fixed points of V connected. This one also, each of the two pieces is fixed points of V connected. So that whole thing's about fixed points of V connected. This one, on the other hand, is fixed points of the induced representation of V connected. Because this side here, well, from what I just wrote there, this is S V tensor rho smash x smash x. All right, so now let's look at what's happening. Remember when I was stabilizing, I was taking a co-limit over some collection of representations in a universe. That was the big thing that I did. I took a co-limit over all those finite dimensional V inside U. So now let's look at the two cases, because for the group of order two, there's exactly two universes. There's the one that only contains trivial representations, or there's the one that contains everything. So that's all I need to worry about. So the first one. My universe is just an infinite direct sum of copies of the trivial representation. So that means that V is always a trivial representation, and so I'm looking at just an ordinary representation sphere, and this whole thing can be written as something like Sn smash x wedge Sn smash x going to Sn wedge smash x cross Sn smash x, going to s n times the regular representation, smash 
x smash x. And when again I'm looking at fixed points because I want a connectivity argument, I see that this is about n connected. Of course, really, the connectivity of x would play a role as well. In that, but the connectivity of x is just going to make this more connected. So if I want worst case scenario estimates, I get that this is about n connected. This one, same thing. It's about n connected. And now I'm stuck because the fixed points of this is again the n sphere. So this one as well is about n connected. The underlying thing, if I just look at the dimension of the sphere, that's 2n. So that's much more connected. But that's saying, for, if I forget all of the equivariance, if I forget all of the group action everywhere, then I'm just looking at the wedge into the product, into the smash product. And I know that the smash product is highly connected compared to the individual pieces. So I want that the underlying thing gets more connected, because if I forget all of the equivariance, I should just be seeing the ordinary argument, the stuff we knew before. It's exactly when I'm looking at the fixed points that I see every one of these is about n connected. So the essential step in the argument last time was this third term was much more highly connected than the first two pieces. So I know that when I'm mapping a sphere into these, as long as n is big enough, when I map it into this one, since this is so much more connected than the other two pieces, I don't see anything. I get 0. So that's why I needed to know that the maps into this was an isomorphism. Here, I can't conclude that. This always has about the same connectivity as these two pieces. So I keep stressing this because the result, namely that a map like this is an equivalence, stably, or put another way, that the left adjoint to the forgetful functor is the right adjoint to the forgetful functor, or put another way, wedges are products, but I'm allowed to permute my factors, does not hold in this case. Yes. Yes, exactly. Well, that's the point of what the universe is. The universe is telling me exactly what sorts of spheres could I be mapping in, and what sort of spheres would I then care about for smashing here. <laughs> Because those are the both of those together are what's building up my co-limit in this. It's the finite dimensional representations in my universe. That's how I'm defining my stable homotopy classes of maps. So in this one, when I perform the stabilization, I just stabilize with respect to trivial spheres. I don't stabilize with respect to representation spheres. They're well, non-trivial representation spheres. Righty. So the way to state this then is that in fact these aren't the same. C2 plus smash x is not the right adjoint. to the forgetful functor. And in fact, we could produce examples, namely, just take x to be the zero sphere. And then that gives you something for which these are exactly the connectivity that I'm claiming in this case. And then you see that I'm looking at, well, at this sequence of maps that I drew. And I see that the maps from S1 into this is non-trivial. It goes in as the equator, as the, as the image of the real axis inside the one-point compactification of C. 
I could have also mapped it into here as this equator. That's a non-trivial map that's not detected here because it was detected in the cofiber. So having said the sad part, now I can say the happy part. And that is that if I'm looking at the complete universe, so u is the infinite direct sum of the regular representation, then, well, I'll just rewrite this whole thing. But if you remember, I mentioned yesterday, as I was talking about stabilization, that I might as well choose actually multiples of some big representation which contains everything. Well, the regular representation works. So I'll just stabilize with respect to those. So I'll look at n copies of the regular representation, wedge n copies of the regular representation into the Cartesian square and then into the smash square which we worked out over here so this is going to be s n rho tensor rho smash x smash x Here? No. I'm just applying this formula to v equals n rho. So. All right. But as you're saying, or as the underlying thing would be, it's not hard to work out what the tensor square of rho is, and this is 2n rho smash x smash x. So now I'll argue my connectivity thing again. What's the connectivities of the underlying things? Well, the underlying thing here, so the underlying vector space for rho is just r squared. So the dimension here is 2n. The dimension here is 2n. The dimension here then is 4n. So this part is about twice as connected as either of these pieces. That's on the underlying, which again is just a sanity check. I know that it's going to work for the underlying. For the fixed points, this one is again about n connected, because remember the fixed points of the regular representation is just the trivial representation. So this is about n connected. This one is again about n connected. Whereas this one, when I'm looking at its fixed points, its fixed points is 2n, so this is about 2n connected. Now I can use my argument. I could either directly apply to the Rodenthal suspension theorem, which is going to tell me about how to understand maps into some big suspension like this, or I can say the connectivities of these are small compared to the connectivity of this, so if, egg, if n gets sufficiently big, then any map from a finite sphere plus n times the regular representation doesn't see this because this is too connected. Could I repeat what I just said? Um, if n is sufficiently big because of the connectivity estimates we just gave, then any map from k plus a multiple of the regular representation into this for k fixed is eventually zero. Because the connectivity, as n gets big, the connectivity of this gets big. In fact, it gets big sort of twice as fast as n does. Whereas the connectivity of the source gets big as n plus some fixed number does. Hmm? Maps from some big sphere into this becomes zero. So then maps from some big sphere into these are isomorphic. So in this case, well, 
I could write the same thing. C2 plus smash something is the right adjoint. To IE upper star. Because this one was the right adjoint. All right, so now that I've done this specific example, I'll just state, but then won't prove because the proof is you just copy this, but you take a little bit of care for the number of factors. I do. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So by, my assumption was that my universe always has the trivial representation in it. So all of my universes include the trivial representation. It's kind of weird in that case. This really only cared, exactly as you pointed out, about the sign representation not having fixed points, but having an underlying non-trivial dimension. So if I did everything and I just allowed multiples of the sign representation, then I'd still be able to run an argument like this, and I'd still see sort of connectivity style arguments that would, that would be OK. The problem is I lose the original stability. I lose the fact that wedges and products are the same. It also starts to have trouble. Uh, yeah. I can get things like this, and they, it, they still work the same way. I mean, you just copy the argument at the same time. But um, if I try to stabilize and I don't include the trivial thing, then, well, my mapping objects aren't necessarily abelian groups. They're just sets. I mean, there's a lot of things that I start to lose. You, don't, you get things that are really weird. You get things that sort of, they're not spectra, but if you forget the group action, then they are spectra. Yeah. Weird. So, okay. So, proposition, which I guess I could say is a fact because I would encourage you to run a similar argument to prove this. And this is that if G mod H embeds into my universe U, then G plus smash over hx is right adjoint, uh, I guess, is also the right adjoint to the forgetful functor in the sense that stable homotopy classes of maps from x into g plus smash over hy are the same as stable homotopy classes of maps from the restriction to h of x into y. If I had them, if I had the order swapped, if I if I swapped the two uh, arguments in this, then that's the definition of induction: that it's the left adjoint to the forgetful functor. Here I'm saying it's also the right adjoint to the forgetful functor. And that's what I argued here. And the G mod H embedding into U, we'll just think of it in the case of, of the group C2. Then I have two options. H is either C2 or, well, H is either C2 or it's trivial. If H is C2, then I'm asking, does a point embed into U? And I know that it does. So it's kind of a, I mean, I could always put it in as the origin. The more interesting one is, does C2 itself embed into my universe U? Let me just check that the two conditions are telling me the right thing. C2 doesn't embed into the trivial representation, because everything in this is fixed. C2 itself is not fixed. In the regular representation, I can embed C2 into it. I could embed it as plus or minus 1. 
if I think of the regular representation as the complex numbers, and then under complex conjugation, those two points are flipped. So it does embed into this universe. It does not embed into this universe. And what we actually argued by my connectivity estimates here is exactly this statement. What's this give us? So I get one thing for free, namely, take y to be the restriction to h of x. Then on the right hand side, I have maps from ih upper star x to itself. And on the left hand side, I have maps from x to g plus smash over h, ih upper star x. And I know these are the same. So the same trick I used last time, namely, take the identity here, it corresponds to some element over here, which is a map, a stable map, from x to g plus smash over h with x. So this map gets a name. This map's called the transfer. It's not, in general, an actual map. It's a stable map. So it means it doesn't exist necessarily if x is just the zero sphere. Then I'm asking, do I have an equivariant map from the zero sphere into g mod h plus? Well, a non-trivial map. So one that adjoints over to the identity. And just think about that. Well, I'm looking at the zero sphere. I have two fixed points. When I look at g mod h plus, I have my fixed point, that's the plus, and then I have g mod h, all the points of which move around. My base point goes to my base point, because it's a pointed map. Where does the other point go? Well, there's nowhere for it to go. The only place it's fixed, so it has to go to some other fixed point, but only the base point is fixed. So the only actual map from the zero sphere to g mod h plus is the one that takes both of my points and crushes them to the base point. If I have a map that actually crushes everything to a point, it's not going to record a lot of information. In fact, it's going to be really tough to then say, take the thing that crushes everything to a point and magically adjoint it over to get the identity which, in particular, doesn't crush everything to a point. So it, what this map does is it somehow takes the point that's non the base, not the base point, and it sends it to the thing that looks like add up all of the points get, that get moved around. If I could add my points, that would be fixed. And that's kind of what it's trying to do. I know that, um, well, you'll hear more about the transfer later with the Becker-Gottlieb transfer. And it's the antecedent for this map. But before I move on, I want to give one other quick construction of it. So let's just construct it for x equals the zero sphere, the one that I was just talking about. And I'll construct this by drawing a picture. So I need to do a stable map. So let's choose some v such that g mod h embeds into v. And well, I said I would draw a picture, so let me start drawing it. Um, to shake things up, I'll do the cyclic group of order 3. And I'll embed the c3 itself into some representation. And the one I can do is the representation that's the complex numbers with multiplication by a primitive third root of unity. So the complex numbers, and I just rotate it. 
by 2 pi over 3. And then I can embed the C3 inside it. Well, I can embed it inside as the third roots of unity. That takes C3 into the complex numbers. And it does so equivariantly. That's It does so equivariantly, because the group is acting by rotating here, and it just sends each of the points to the next, because I'm multiplying by one of them. But now what I can do is I can do a tome collapse map. So in fact, if you think about the cobordism talk that we saw earlier, what did I do? I took some manifold, and I embedded it into a big copy of Euclidean space. I took the normal bundle. I observed the normal bundle was actually the same as the little tiny tubular neighborhood, and then I crushed the complement to the normal bundle to a point. Let's copy that. Here, I have a manifold. It's a collection of points. So it's a zero manifold. The group acts, so it's a G manifold. And then I've embedded this in a big Euclidean space. But when I'm embedding a G manifold into a Euclidean space, I want it to be an equivariant embedding. So that means the group better be acting on the Euclidean space, otherwise I'm going to have a lot of trouble embedding a manifold with a non-trivial action in. So here I chose one. That's what this condition is. And I've embedded my G mod H as a G manifold into this big Euclidean space. Now I take a little, a little tubular neighborhood of each of my points. And I tome collapse. But what happened when I tome collapsed? Each of these little disks is actually the same as the unit disk in this representation. I've just moved them by the group. So this takes me to C3 plus smash, and then I took any one of these disks and I crushed out its boundary. So this is the unit disk in the v-sphere, modulo the boundary of the unit disk in the v-sphere, and that's just the v-sphere. Hmm? This? It is, but I would, uh, I'm crushing, when I crush, I'm, I'm crushing the complement of this open thing. So I've, that includes the boundary and all the, it's setting the boundary of my open disk equal to the pointed infinity. I have all of my little open disks and I crush the complement of all of my open disks to a single point. Mm -hmm. And so this gives me a map. Of course, I could also put in the pointed infinity and it also goes to the base point. So this produced for me a map from the v-sphere to C3 plus smash the v-sphere. And any, whenever I can embed g mod h into v, I can do this. The picture shows you what I'm supposed to do. This is really just a copy of a generic g mod h sitting inside v. I embed it in, I take a tiny tubular neighborhood, and I tom collapse. This is a map from the v-sphere to the v-fold suspension. of C3 plus, which is, of course, C3 plus smash the zero sphere. And this was the v-fold suspension of the zero sphere. So that was the map I wanted. I wanted a stable map from the zero sphere to C3 plus, but all I have to do is produce some big suspension of it. I'll leave it to you to check that this map actually is the same, once I smash it with a generic x, is the same as that one. So in other words, it's realizing the adjunction that I want. It's another way to prove that g, mod, uh, that g plus smash over h is the right adjoint. All right. So as a corollary to this, well, 
there are a bunch of corollaries. The first of which is that the finite G sets are self-dual in the sense that if I look at pointed maps from T into anything else, so I'll say the sphere, but it doesn't matter. This is the same as maps from the sphere into T plus. So I have this very surprising symmetry that if I had finite G sets, in fact, I might as well not have used the sphere there. I could have put anything, but then I would still have the sphere in this coordinate. Or I could say T plus smash X into Y is the same as maps from X into T plus smash Y. I can transparently move smashing with T plus to either side in this. So why is this the case? Well, when I look at finite G sets, I break them up into orbits. Then when we break it up into orbits, this becomes sort of a, a wedge of these pointed G sets. I know since I'm stable that wedges look like products because that's exactly the condition of stability for just the trivial representation. So it's sufficient to just break it up into orbits and then apply the result that G mod H plus into something I'm mapping out of the left adjoint to the Foucault functor, so this is just zero map, uh, maps from the zero sphere, the zero sphere, H equivariantly, but this is the same as maps from the zero sphere into G mod H plus because G plus smash over H with the zero sphere is also the right adjoint. And so this and this are the same. In fact, that's exactly my next point. This means that my homotopy groups are functors of the are functors of the orbit category in two different ways. They're simultaneously a functor of the orbit category in a covariant direction and in a contravariant direction. homotopy groups, stable homotopy class of maps between x and y is a functor, well, I'll just write it out, is a Mackey functor. So this is really a pair of functors, a covariant functor, In this case, the covariant functor is x into y smash whatever plus. And this is a functor on finite G sets or on the orbit category. And a contravariant functor which is in this case x smash something plus into y, and these are the same on objects, but of course, as you pointed out, one's covariant and one's contravariant, so they're obviously not the same on maps. And then they satisfy some compatibility conditions that I don't want to get into. Namely, if I compose the covariant and contravariant parts, then I can get to and from the same, the value at the same group in different ways, and I have some formula that tells me exactly how to do it. It's really not hard to remember. Namely, it all boils down to if I had something on both sides, so if I did x smash 
t plus into y smash r plus, then I can pull the r plus to this side, or I can push the t plus to this side, and in both cases, I know what to do because I have my functoriality. So it's exactly just a sanity check that says this structure is compatible with the fact that these are naturally isomorphic. Okay, there's a bunch of other things that I get for free that I don't want to spend too much time on. So I want to do another example. So in particular, I said that the finite G sets are self-dual. I actually get that G manifolds. have a good duality. So a T a duality holds, if you're familiar with it. And all of my, all of the objects in my Spanier Whitehead category have what are called S duals. So it's not the case that they're act they have real duals because they might not, the dual might not take me back to the zero sphere. It might take me to some other sphere of some non-trivial dimension. If I ignore that, that failure, which is actually, in some sense, the chief failure of the Spanier-Whitehead category, I don't have negative representation spheres in the Spanier-Whitehead category, then it's good enough. So I have a, all of my duality works nicely. So in the time remaining, I want to look at I want to look at an example of another cohomology theory. So let's do something a little different. I'm going to stick with C2, and I want to copy more of what Brooke did today. Brooke told you about K-theory. I'm again going to tell you about K-theory. But I want to do something actually geometric, because it may be easier to visualize this. So what I'll talk about now is real K-theory. And, um, and I'll try to distinguish between just what Brooke was saying, namely the usual version of real K-theory, and this real K-theory in the way I just did. So you'll hear the emphasis when I focus on the capital R, real K-theory. So there's a notion, well, Brooke spent some time this morning, we heard a talk a couple days ago, about what do I mean by a vector bundle. So now I can ask the question, what do I mean by an equivariant vector bundle? So I can, get, I can ask you, what would you guess an equivariant vector bundle is? Exactly. G acts on the total space of the vector bundle, and the map from the total space to the base is equivariant. So this is kind of a recurring theme in algebraic topology. You take some notion that you had before, and you literally add the word equivariant any time it would make sense as an adjective. <laughs> and then you've got the equivariant notion of the same thing. For real K-theory, though, I'm going to rely on the fact that the complex numbers is a finite dimensional Galois extension of the real numbers. And that Galois group is, of course, C2. This, this happens depressingly infrequently in the geometric context. Yeah? Um, let's talk about that one after. I, I'm literally just saying that C is the algebraic closure of R, and it's two-dimensional. So. C doesn't have other finite index fields. Well, that's probably actually, yeah, I'll just say that. It doesn't have other finite index closed fields. So the ones that I would care about are those. And I know a bunch about automorphisms, so I'm sort of stuck. But I want to do geometry. And so let me describe another version of vector bundles where I have this group acting. Because I can ask that the action on my vector bundle, remembering complex conjugation, is in that way compatible with the action on my base. 
So a real vector bundle, oops, I already spelled it wrong, real vector bundle is, um, uh, is a, it's a complex vector bundle. <laughs> E over x, such that, of course, both of these are C2 spaces. But the C2 action has to live over the action here, so I can look at what it does to a single fiber. And I'll say that C2 is generated by um, an element gamma. So gamma, viewed as a map from E over some point little x, to E over the point gamma of little x is conjugate linear. That's an R. So if I was in an equivariant vector bundle, I would insist that the map actually be linear. That it's a map of vector bundles sitting over it. So it preserves the vector bundle structure. This is not. I'm insisting that it be conjugate linear instead. If you're familiar with the notion of descent, then this sort of thing is going to make sense to you. So what's descent say? Descent says, how do I detect when a vector space is the complexification of a real vector space? And of course, I mean, sort of a, for vector space, it's kind of a stupid statement, because I know a vector space that any complex vector space is the complexification of. Namely, I choose a basis, I take the real span of that basis, and then when I complexify it, I get my original vector space back. That's not natural, though. I chose a basis, and we know, from the moment we start doing anything with categories, we know that the words choose tends to be a horrifically unnatural operation, and choose a basis is sort of the, the worst of all possible worlds from that perspective. So I can do it, but I'm doing it in, in a, an unseemly way. Descent provides a way for me to do it naturally. If I look at C to the n itself, then complex conjugation still acts on that, because complex conjugation acts on C. And I can recover the real numbers out of the complex numbers as the fixed points of complex conjugation. So if I had C to the n, then I can recover a canonical version of R to the n sitting inside it, by just remembering that it's the fixed points of the complex conjugation action. So same sort of thing here. What's complex conjugation on a vector space? The complex conjugation on a complex vector space is a conjugate linear map from the vector space to itself. That it squares the identity, the sort of expected thing. So it looks exactly like complex conjugation, and complex conjugation isn't complex linear, obviously, but it is uh, conjugate linear. So I'm just doing that notion in families. OK. So Atia defined this, and he showed the following uh, relatively simple geometric things. Well, first, I could define kr0 of x to be the Grotendieck group of isomorphism classes of finite dimensional real vector bundles on x. And again, like Brooke did, I'm just going to assume x is compact, and then I don't have to worry really about whether I put in, um, uh, put in inverses if I reduce. And that uh, mod the trivials. So let me compute this in two examples. So example one. Let's say that x is a point, a point with a trivial action. What are the real vector bundles on this? Well, what's? What's a vector bundle over a point? 
Let's just start with that part of the data. What's a complex vector bundle over a point? It's a complex vector space. And then what's the action on the point? It's trivial. So that means that the, the map gamma that I'm endowed with takes my complex vector space back to itself, and it's conjugate linear by definition. So in fact, this is the same descent data that I mentioned earlier. That to give myself a complex vector space together with a conjugate linear map on it that squares the identity is to specify a canonical real vector space, namely the fixed points, whose complexification is the vector space I started with. So the real K theory of a point is just KO of a point. And in fact, I should have done the zero sphere, but if I did the reduced or not. And more generally, if X has a trivial action, then you copy that same argument. Over each point, I have a complex vector space, which has a conjugate linear involution. So over each point, I really have a canonical real vector space. And I'm looking at a real vector bundle over X. So this is just KO of X. On the other hand, if X is C2, what happens here? I get the complex K theory of a point. Why? Well, this isn't actually any condition. What do I have? I have two points that are being swapped. And then I have a complex vector space over each of those points. And my map gamma is just a conjugate linear isomorphism from this vector space to that vector space. So it says that really I only have one vector space. That specifying it over a single point uniquely specifies it over the other point. But I haven't put any constraints on the vector space over my starting point. So there's nothing that happens there. This is just complex K theory, so K or KU, of a point. And the same thing is going to be true more generally, that I'd see that KR of something with a free action, in which uh, the stabilizer of every point is trivial, is just the ordinary complex K theory of the quotient. So from this perspective, real K theory is an equivariant cohomology theory that subsumes both ordinary complex K theory and ordinary real K theory. Atiyah used this to give a very beautiful proof of bot periodicity in the real case which he then used to show that you had bot periodicity in the real case. So the bot periodicity in this case is that it says that the real K theory of the, the compactification of the complex numbers, so that same regular representation sphere, smash any X, is the real K theory of X. So this is a little different. Normally, we'd seen periodicity. The periodicity was actually expressing some statement about a suspension by a trivial representation, namely the homotopy groups, have some periodic phenomena that, for complex K theory, all of the even homotopy groups are the same. All the odd homotopy groups are the same. So I only have to specify two things. For real K theory, this isn't even or odd. This is a representation dimension. 
And if I move into this representation dimension, then my homotopy groups are isomorphic. From this, you can deduce the other things. So applying these that this part's a little trickier, but you can also get it. But it says that the real K theory is eight periodic. And that the complex K theory is two periodic. The complex K theory one is actually much easier, and you can just do it right from this. Just replace every instance of x with C2 plus smash x. That frees up the action. And when I do C2 plus smash it, well, the representation sphere just sort of moves in. And once I've freed up the action, I can't tell the difference between the representation sphere and a trivial sphere of the same underlying dimension. So when I free up the action, this sphere becomes just the two sphere. And now I'm looking at the real K theory of C2 plus smash S2 smash X is the same as the real K theory of C2 plus smash X. I apply this, and when I do C2 plus smash X mod C2, that's the same thing as just x. And I end up looking at the complex k theory of the second suspension of x is the complex k theory of x. So I guess in the lack of time remaining, I'll say everything that Brooks said about spectra and about the k theory spectrum, and particularly we know the spaces in that spectrum, they're all BU, or z cross bu's or u's, and look at the infinite unitary group, works here too. What's the group action on these? Well, the unitary group, these were collections of complex matrices. So I can do complex conjugation on those. And that gives me a continuous map from the unitary group to itself. And it induces for me uh, maps on all of these. So I'm out of time. So I'll stop here. If you want, uh, we can talk more privately about the underlying geometry for more of this as well. Thank you.